This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So this week I want to think through uh, a few more of the implications that flow from that understanding which comes out of uh, Marx's thinking about how to describe the essence, if you want to call it that. He doesn't use that term, but I will. The essence of a capitalist society, what it's really, what it's really about. And I think that uh, uh, the, the depiction he, he sets up uh, suggests that there are a whole set of, uh, of, of tasks that we need uh, to uh, start to address in creating uh, new forms of uh, politics and actually envisioning uh, a socialist uh, future and a socialist world. Now, I'm going to take a flyer here and, and say some things that probably will not be very popular with certain people and probably generate a little bit of outrage. So I'm, but I, but, but I, want, to, I want to take up uh, what might be the logical consequences of uh, thinking through the transitions that, that Marx was, was concerned with in the creation of an alternative to capitalist society. In, in doing this, I think that there's, there are some principles which Marx uh, advanced, which I think are, are you know, really important to acknowledge and, and to work with. Uh, one of them is the principle that uh, a revolutionary transformation uh, does not uh, entail the complete wiping out of everything that we know and everything that we have. Uh, it is about taking those elements in the contemporary society which can be reconfigured uh, around something which is radically different and antagonistic to the nature of a capitalist society. And what that means is that there has to be a revolution uh, which takes us away from uh, the abstractions of value theory. There has to be a revolution that takes us away from uh, the stock market valuations and all of those things. There has to be a revolution uh, which takes us away from the extractivism towards uh, the natural world and, and, and the like. But all of these things have to happen, but they cannot happen in a way which do, is not uh, rooted in the contemporary conditions. So one of the things that we obviously would take is to say, in what ways do contemporary technologies allow for us to do something radically different? In what ways can we actually start to think of human relations uh, in ways which are really very different? And in this, uh, I think there's something interesting in that uh, passage which uh, I, I, I quoted last time when, when I'm, I'm discussing uh, uh, just discussing the, the, the forms uh, which which uh, capital can take and that dialectic between the creativity side of things and the revolutionary transformation side of things on the one hand and the failure uh, to deal with alienation and the failure to create satisfaction and meaning uh, in the contemporary world situation. Uh, and... I think that this is um, something that uh, I'm, I'm very, very concerned with uh, in the following sense. Uh, Marx kind of says uh, that he wants to consider the full development of human mastery over the forces of nature, those of so-called nature, as well as of humanity's own nature. Now that's an interesting kind of thing. It kind of says basically human nature is, is malleable, malleable. Human nature can change. In what ways must we think of transition to an anti-capitalist society is about a transformation not only in our relation to nature and our metabolic relation to nature, but also in humanity's own nature. 
Now, how is that nature established and where does it come from? Marx argues that it has everything to do with experience of daily life and we create a human nature as a result of our daily living practices and all the rest of it and much of what we end up doing is uh, reshaping uh, our human nature around a different set of precepts and a different set of ideas. Now, one of the things I think was very important to do for me was in studying the whole kind of transition that occurred in the rise of neoliberalism was actually the subtext was to think about the way in which human nature changed from, say, 1970 to 2020. Over these 50 years, in what ways? Now, human nature will not change the same in all places at all times. I mean, it's not as if the whole world changes its human nature and goes does so in concordance. But I think what we've seen is an evolution in human nature in, for instance, the United States. Uh, and uh, an evolution in human nature uh, from, say, the sort of situation that existed back in the 1960s and 1970s in France and Britain and, 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 and the like. So I think I think the idea that there have been changes in human nature over time and according to dynamics of particular places, that idea is, I think, for me, an obvious truth. And if that is an obvious truth, then the question arises, how uh, and in what ways are we going to start to think about changing human nature? Now, we can actually try to do it by kind of saying, well, you should be more moral. And so there's a kind of movement of uh, morality and kind of saying, you know, we should try to be good people. We should uh, change our definition of what is a good citizen. Uh, take it away from a good citizen is somebody who does not make any demands upon the state to a situation where a good citizen is somebody who contributes uh, to human welfare uh, as much as possible. And at the same time, it puts demands upon the state so the state deals with the needs of the mass of the population uh, for questions of you know, health care and education and, uh, and all, all right. So in other words, but it also entires, entails a revolution in, in education. What kinds of precepts are we going to educate, bring to, 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 to life in education? Uh, the educational system over the last 40, 50 years has become increasingly neoliberal in its moral content. It's more about you know, self-reliance. It's more about you know, doing for yourself. It's the entrepreneurialism of the self. It's all about saying, well, if you fail, it's because uh, you did not, uh, it was all your fault. So there's been a fantastic way in which we see the transformations going on in our society uh, where uh, human nature uh, has uh, been shifting and changing. So when Marx kind of says this, you know, we've not only got to change our relation to nature, but we've also got to change uh, our human nature, I think that this is a very, very significant kind of idea and something that needs, needs to be thought of, and therefore it's not a moral question in the sense that, well, okay, if I go off and I read the right books and I get the right morality, I will come out and say I'm a good moral person because I did A or I did B, something like that. Marx's definition of human nature is about what you do in daily life and how you rationalize what you do in daily life uh, to, to, to keep your own self-respect and to keep yourself sort of alive and alert and all the rest of it. But it is about the qualities of daily life. And if the qualities of daily life are such that you see kind of certain forms of consumerism and consumption going on, you see certain kinds of... Uh, denigration of other human beings, you see uh, the mistreatment of animals, you see the, 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 the mistreatment of the environment, you see the, the callous way in which uh, environments are used and utilized for, for profitable purposes, all of those sorts of things, we see that going on, then we kind of say, well, it's, if we're going to change human nature, we're going to have to change daily life, because human nature arises out of daily life. Now, you can't do that all at one shot. There is a gradual process of transformation. The neoliberal definition of human nature has only become deeply instantiated in all of this 
over a period of 50 years. In other words, the transformation of human nature from what might be called a, a Fordist, collectivist kind of human nature, which, which largely predominated in the 1960s. If we go from that to this kind of individualistic, uh, entrepreneurial kind of stuff, well, okay, it, it, it's not as if everybody moved at the same time, everybody moved at the same pace. It's not as if everybody's moved. There are still plenty of residuals around of, uh, of uh, the, the sorts of you know, manifestations of human nature that existed before. So that is, if you like, one, one, one of the first points I would want, I want to make. Uh, the second point is I, I, I want to take that, that uh, contrast, which I, met, I really got involved in last time, between those two perspectives on a capitalist society, and kind of say, well, to what degree is it fair to say that the, the, those, the, the contradictory unity that exists between those two perspectives, which is where I sort of was ending up, the contradictory unity between them, uh, puts us in a situation where almost certainly any transition which occurs is going to have to build upon that contradictory unity and it cannot evade it. It cannot sort of throw it all one side and say, okay, let's start all over again. Let's go back to the ancients or let's go back to peasant society or let's go back to indigenous society or whatever. We can't do that. We've got to, to, to deal with uh, the situation as it is right now. And here I think there's a, 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 a very interesting way in which the contradictory nature of what I was talking about between those two perspectives on the capitalist society that Marx builds into his account in the Grundrisse, that that contradictory is, 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 if you like, at the core of exactly what it is uh, that we might look for when we're starting to think about the move towards alternatives. And it's here I'm going to get rather specific. Because it's clear to me from the way in which those two alternatives are set up that you cannot avoid certain dangers occurring on some side. That the positive things that you can read from, for instance, the transformation of the productive forces under capitalism and the perpetual increases in the productivity of social labor. You cannot move from that to something else without there being some strong controlling influence. And those strong controlling influences are therefore entail uh, some sort of possibility for socialism in the future. Now, there's an interesting kind of history of a certain kind of approach to this question. And it's really uh, uh, an idea that uh, Rosa Luxemburg articulated. And some people say she got it from Kautsky. But it's been sort of in the history of, of uh, Marxist thinking. And it's the idea that uh, the society is, is actually facing a choice between socialism or barbarism. The French even had a, a political movement uh, after World War II and continues in some res respects up to this day of socialismo and barbarism. And, 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 and that socialism and barbarism uh, is, is, is something which is, which is significant. And there are some people who've argued that we've, you know, we've fallen into barbarism uh, you know, from the 1980s onwards, neoliberalism was, in, was a certain kind of barbarism. And uh, let's face it, uh, Chile and Argentina and all these things are pretty barbaric uh, forms of, uh, of, of government. Uh, and we have a, the kind of peaceful barbarism of the Reagan-Thatcher uh, system. Uh, we have the barbarism of uh, Tony Blair and Clinton and so on. So. Uh, th there's a kind of notion of somehow or other the socialism has fallen apart and we're just basically left with the barbarism on one side. But when I think about the, the relationship that Marx is proposing between those two accounts of the nature of capitalism, one of which is pointing towards a, a certain kind of barbarism, uh, of universal alienation, uh, of emptiness, uh, of uh, the inability to gain any satisfaction, 
that kind of barbarism uh, is very much uh, involved and therefore is against the kind of the achievement of that socialism which uh, is, is earlier mentioned. So socialism or barbarism? But I kind of thinking about this and thinking to myself, well, this is the wrong way to think about it. You think about those two descriptions and I think what you would end up with is to say the mission is the construction of a unified com communism which necessarily internalizes both barbarism and humanistic socialism. Now, this is a pretty scary idea. And, but it, it comes out of the idea that there are certain issues which we're faced with right now that cannot be solved by saying, well, it's all a matter of individual choice or it's all a matter of uh, democratic governance and so on. And, 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 and therefore, you know, that means that the certain things cannot really be addressed. No. I think there's no future for humanity that does not actually rely upon the exercise of a very strong, almost absolutist authority. And that therefore it is going to be only through some kind of exercise of an authority, which can be collectively supported, which is why you know some of the populist movements right now are significant, can be collectively supported as being absolutely necessary to solve a particular problem. Take the, the mini example right now. How do we solve this virus problem? What we see is Western democracies in a complete mess of it. They can't do it. And people kind of say, you can't do it because, well, if you ban people from doing certain kinds of things, then what happens is that you're violating religious freedoms, for example. And we've had that problem in the United States uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, some of the religious groups say that they want, to, they want to continue to have their services in the way they've done before. They don't want to wear masks and therefore uh, they're going to continue that way. And then, then the scientists come along and say, oh, well, but that's that you're, you're being super spreaders. Uh, in New York, there have been a conflict between the governor and uh, some of the, the Hasidic Jewish communities. Uh, precisely because they're, they're, they're continuing uh, their religious practices and their religious practices are in fact um, uh, super spreader events. Uh, uh, and of course we see Donald Trump engaging in, in certain politics of that as well. Um, so th there has to be some, some mandates and some mandates that are enforced and followed. And then you kind of say, well, look at, at the situation of what's happening with this virus in the United States. We've already lost, what, 210, 215,000 people, deaths. By the new year, if things are going on as they're going on right now, we will have 400,000, we'll have half a million, uh, probably in January sometime. Half a million deaths, and it will still be going on, and, and there will be no control. Uh, Britain is in very much a similar situation. Spain is in a similar situation. All of the Western democracies are in a mess. But what about China? China, which was really hit very hard in the first part and obviously made some serious missteps, but when China got out of business and said, we're going to crack this thing, they cracked it. The number of deaths in China is down way. The number of new infections is way down. They've been opening up factories. They've been opening up. Shanghai is apparently all the bars are open and everybody's out there, you know, making merry and so on. China has effectively dealt with the problem. And why has it effectively dealt with the problem? Well, because it has an authoritarian kind of government. And it has shamelessly grabbed hold of anybody who is seen to be sick. They test a lot and if they find you sick, you're put, you, you, you don't move. And, but the result, result of that authority and the exercise of that authority is the society is much better off. Everybody can now enjoy a certain kind of life. And if there are small outbreaks because foreigners come in with carrying the disease or something of that kind, it's almost immediately closed down. There are some democracies that have managed to do this. New Zealand managed to do it. But it did it by absolutely having an, an absolute 
mandate about what shall or shall not be allowed and how it shall be done. The inability to impose that mandate or to enforce that mandate is creating the problem. And it's not only the problem of the virus and all of the sickness and all of the death that goes with it, because it has profound effects upon the economy. So the economies of Western Europe and North America are in difficulty precisely because of the virus and what the virus is about. So, and the, and the China, but the Chinese economy is reviving. And you suddenly look at all of the data and you kind of say, well, actually demand from China is actually helping to revive the economies in many parts of the world. I mean, China is, is right now, not only solving the, 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 the problem of uh, the virus, it's also solving the economic problem. And it's solving it in a way which, given that it takes imports and exports and involves in trade, it's, evolving, it's, it's doing it in such a way as to actually give some life to the global economy. Now, I'd like to point out to you something here, and that is that in the nature of capitalism in general, in 2008, there is no question in my mind, it's something which you absolutely have to accept and have to work with, that China saved global capitalism from deep, deep depression. It was the Chinese reflation of the economy and the kind of huge building boom that was set up, where China actually not only rebuilt its own economy and its own demand structures, but actually you know, put demands out for raw materials and all the rest of it. So all those countries providing raw materials to China suddenly found themselves uh, you know, developing very fast and, and coming out of the crisis very fast. So China solved the problem of capitalist disruption and the crisis of 2008 almost single-handedly. But look. It's now doing it again. Which kind of economic order is going to successfully develop capitalism, but at the same time, and here I want to point this out, China's government is a communist government, and they have 90 million people in the Communist Party. It is organized through the Communist Party. It is an organized economy, which is centralized and decentralized and all kinds of complicated things that are going on there. So if you were sitting on out of, from outer space and making judgments about what is the most, you know, what's going on on planet Earth, and you'd look at it and you say, well, the one place where they seem to be working things out and getting things going and that everything is going kind of quite well, in spite of all of the, 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 the difficulties, the one place that's working pretty well is China. And it's interesting that those countries which are closely liaised with China in certain ways, which include you know, South Korea and include you know, Taiwan and, 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 and the like, most of those economies have dealt with the, with the crisis rather well. And if you could then therefore said, that what is the most effective form of governance for global capitalism right now in terms of its development? It will be the Chinese form of government, which means we should all become communists in the Chinese sense, if we want an effective capitalism. But here I would also say that the same thing applies because China is dealing with not only capitalism in general, but actually combines the barbarism and the socialism. Social provision in China has been revolutionized over the past 10 or 15 years and is continuing to be revolutionized. So they've not only been dealing with the poverty problem and with the, with the distribution problem to some degree, not very effectively, as effectively as they should. But they're, they're also, they're also so, so China is combining some barbaric practices by our definition. Uh, the attack upon the Uyghurs, which doesn't seem to me to make much sense to me, but apparently does to the Chinese. But the, the, the social controls and the political controls are, are, uh, are unacceptable to many Westerners, but the Westerners are unable to deal with the situation given their particular forms of governance and given their forms of, of economy. So here you have a situation where the form which is likely to occur in, into the future is going to be some combination of 
humanistic socialism and what that's about and some barbaric practices. I think there's no choice. Now, it's interesting if you go back and you look, for example, at the environmental question. There was this famous uh, uh, article by a man called Garrett Hardin called The Tragedy of the Commons. And what Hardin sort of talked about was the exploitation of a common property resource by many people who would, you know, freely feed a posset, and the result was that the resource would be destroyed. Uh, the assumption of most uh, economists in, in the Western world was, well, the answer to this problem was private property. But that wasn't Hardin's point at all. Hardin's point was, there's no way in which you're going to be able to solve this environmental problem outside of an authoritarian form of government. And it had to be authoritarian, it had to be mandated, and it had to be rig you know, really rigid, rigorous in its enforcement of, uh, of, of, of it. And I think with the environmental question, there's absolutely no way it's going to be solved by the sorts of politics which we've been seeing surrounding the environmental question in, in, in so-called Western democracies. I say so-called Western democracies, not because they're so-called Western, because they're so-called democracies. They're not really democracies. It's very hard to look at the United States and say this is a democracy. It's, uh, uh, it's a sort of shell game for the uh, politics is a shell game for the oligarchy, and that's it. And right now, of course, we've got a you know, there is there is there is a certain political ferment, but you're going to need an authority. You're going to need a mandate. You're going to have to impose a mandate. You're going to have to enforce a mandate. The only way in which you're going to solve a problem is going to be through some sort of legislation. And it has to be a collective agreement, and a collective agreement that really works. Now, the idea that somehow or other wearing a mask is something which is somehow or other, you know, I, I don't understand the difference between wearing a seatbelt in a car and wearing masks. Wear, wearing a seatbelt in a car is, is mandatory, and, and, and uh, you can get fined if you get caught driving without a seat belt and all this kind of thing. I know that I'm sure there are people out there who decide they're not going to wear a seat belt, but, but you know. The same thing true with masks. It's through the use of masks, we can control this, this, uh, this uh, system. And that seems to me to be crucial. And, and, and therefore, the mandate becomes significant. So what I would want to suggest is that when we're thinking about the future, we don't shy away from the question of what is it that's going to be mandatory, how we're going to organize authority, and how that authority is going to be deployed and, dis and, and, and set up. Now, my initial argument was you can't do this unless you've already got institutions and you've already got structures which are doing exactly that already, and they just have to be repurposed and redirected. For instance, one of the ways which is, a, which is a, a, if you like, a, a, a mandatory structure is every time there's a, there's a, there's a serious problem uh, in the economy uh, in, in, the, in the West, the central banks are called in. And they say it's the central banks which are supposed to solve it. And the central banks are, in fact, non-democratic institutions. They're part of what I call the state finance nexus. And together with the Treasury departments, they exercise uh, an authoritarian power. In other words, this idea that we have a free market is nonsense. Yes, we have a free market in certain things, but we don't have a free market when it comes to the ways in which uh, the Federal Reserve and the other world's major central banks uh, start to sort of pump money into the system. And what, for what purpose? And what does it mainly do? Well, it mainly jacks up the stock market. Okay, here you go. Here's the abstraction. We've got to get rid of that abstraction. We don't want a central bank that simply is concerned with uh, uh, issuing, issuing money and, and printing money so that it keeps the stock market up. We don't want that. We want a central bank which targets what it's doing in such a way as to create jobs, to create employment, to create consumer capacity and power so that everybody can have a decent life and a decent living environment in, in wherever they happen to be located. That's what we want the central banks to be poised to do. But when the European Central Bank was set up, it was set up 
that its only mission was to control inflation. It had no mission in terms of employment. It had no mission in terms of social well-being or social welfare. We should have central banks and treasury departments which are mandated to take care of social well-being, social welfare. And to some degree, from what I understand of the Chinese financial system, there is some element of, of that being sort of entered into the, 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 the Chinese situation. Now, I, what's going to happen here is people are going to say, well, you're an apologist for all of the authoritarianism in China and this kind of stuff. No, I'm not. And I think there's a lot of things to be said critically about China. But I want to point out to you that they are the only society so far that has come up with a way of dealing with, first, the financial crisis of 2007-2008. Secondly, the, 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 the corona crisis and all that's been flowing from that. So... Maybe we should look very carefully at what they're doing and how they're doing it, and then ask ourselves what they're doing and how they're doing it, to what degree can it be repurposed towards social well-being and social welfare. Now, guess what? The Chinese Communist Party is still a Communist Party. It still has elements of Maoism in it, and it still has some of the elements, and there are, within the Communist Party, Movements are kind of saying we should not completely organize ourselves to compete and therefore look like what's going on in Western Europe. They are not the model. We have our own model and we can actually take up this high kind of question of socialist humanism and start to repurpose what is going on in terms of centralized power and how that centralized power works with the decentralization of local power, how all that works in China in such a way as to deal with the social well-being problem. And we can deal with it in such a way as to deal with the employment problem. So China, it seems to me, is something which we need to look at very carefully. And the problem, of course, is as soon as you say that in the Western world, everybody kind of says, oh, no, 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 no. they're authoritarian, they're anti-democratic, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of say, sorry, what is anti-authoritarian about the Federal Reserve? What is anti, uh, you know, what is, what is democratic about the, the, the Federal Reserve? What is, what is democratic about uh, even Congress? You know, I mean, we, 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 in the United States, we have this weird situation where 20% of the population control 60% of the votes in the, in the Senate. And therefore, they can block almost anything. So, so you know, this is not a democracy. You need some radical reforms to, create, to, to get it back to any kind of level of equality. You don't even have to have a socialist uh, movement. Or oh, well, One of the things that is desperately needed in the United States right now is a Republican movement to try to recover the idea that this is a republic, and a republic in which the government is of the people, for the people, not you know, for, for the oligarchy. So this is, the, this is the, 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 the real challenge, it seems to me. And, and, and what that says is that we actually have to start to think about the transformation of our human nature. Human nature in China has changed very ra radically over the last 30, 40 years too, not necessarily for the better because a lot of it has become highly you know, uh, neoliberal in its, in its, in, in its functioning and, 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 and people are chancing and gambling and speculating and doing all those things which, which uh, seem to keep uh, everybody in the West fully entertained. Uh, so this is a, you know, it's not as if everything is okay there, but I would ask you to take a very cool look at what is happening in China and ask yourself the question, are there elements of what's going on there which actually have a future in terms of coming to terms with this idea of a communism which accepts certain levels of authoritarianism which will be described as barbaric by many but at the same time is taking care of social questions and environmental questions there's no way it seems to me we're going to solve the environmental problem without serious mandates which are enforced and enforced by authoritarian powers and we're not going to be able to deal with much of the social inequality problem without that either. So the future of socialism, it seems to me, is going to have to take up that contrast which Marx draws 
in the Grundrisse between this creative force on the one hand and this denying, uh, alienating force on the other hand, has to take that up and confront it and use some of the institutions which are building there in a way which is much, much more uh, uh, satisfying and allows us to get through what is a very, very difficult situation right now. I started off by saying, look, yes, we might need a barbaric uh, solution, but, the, but we're already in a, a barbaric solution right now when you take all of the levels of suicide which are around the world, the, the diminished power and the drug addictions and the opioids and all of these kinds of things. The world is in is, 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 is many ways, is, you know, when we come to the crisis of affordable housing, uh, lack of health care, adequate health care initiatives and all the rest of it, the world is already in a mess. And it's only going to get out of that mess by some major adjustments and some major adjustments in thinking. And while I turn to the Chinese case in desperation, because at least there's a way of thinking about these things that seems to have some purchase. And it, but it, that too has to be repurposed uh, and repurposed so that it really deals with environmental issues, with, which the Chinese have not been doing very effectively, and deals also with the social inequality issue where they have uh, let things go loose in many ways. So. Please don't think I'm being an apologist for China. All I'm doing is pointing out to you that capital survived in 2008 because of China. It's surviving now because of China. And that if that is the case, then we have to deal with the China issue. And we have to deal with it not in the way that is being dealt with it in, in this country in terms of the politics, which is an anti-Chinese politics. It has to be, okay, what can we learn from China? What can we take from China? What can we use from China, which is going to allow us both to make a much more sophisticated understanding of how to manage capital in its dying days and how to turn that and repurpose it in a way which is about the creation of a communist future. And that is something which needs to be articulated. And right now, of course, if I articulate that in the United States, I'm going to be have a lot of hate mail, and it's going to be very uh, dangerous and very difficult because things are becoming very rough uh, around the politics right now. So with that uh, thought, I'll leave you with my happy flower and my, my little piece of nature which I'm enjoying uh, and uh, hope that you can get some satisfaction too out of these little things. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.